All right. Um, testing, testing. Uh, could somebody just post a comment confirming if my audio is coming through nice and clear this time? Um, I made a mistake on the last stream, and it was my uh, webcam mic and not the headset that I was wearing. Yay, right on. Thank you so much for confirming that, Christopher. First, sorry so much for everyone who's been waiting here for the last while. Um, two totally unrelated technical hiccups uh, resulted in me here um, a half hour late and not able to update you guys on the situation. So I really appreciate those <laughs> of you who stuck through for the last half hour. That's uh, quite an embarrassment for run number two that I thought was uh, going to run a little bit more smoothly because I spent a bit more time on the AV prep. Anyways, all the same, we're going to launch right into this. Um, so. This is now sort of presentation two of what I'm hoping to do is a, a bi-week or bi-monthly um, event to do a really deep technical analysis of some aspects of e-bikes and e-bike conversions or electric vehicles in general. And uh, for the topic this week, we're doing multiple motor drives. Um, and this came up, uh, it's come up routinely for us as a, as a business right down to some of our very first e-bike projects involved setting up um, e-bike or other EV systems with multiple motors. Um, and for some reason, in the last two or three weeks, we had upwards of 15 people uh, emailing us actively at the same time, um, looking for guidance and help on two-wheel drive, and in some case, three-wheel drive e-bike setups. Um, you can see one of them on the uh, screen here is, a, is a, a fat bike tricycle that a guy in France, in, uh, uh, France built using uh, three direct drive hub motors that he wanted to be able to cruise around on the beach with. Um, and so this was an application where, given the massive amount of resistance riding through the sand and other soft terrain like that, um, a single hub motor would simply spin out. Um, all three of them gives the kind of traction that's required and allows it to climb up even kind of the steepest grades that you could encounter. Um, and on the left here, you see uh, one of my earlier dual motor bike setups. Uh, this was a bike that I built. Uh, when we were doing a trip down to Maker Fair in San Francisco, and we decided, me and my friend Robbie, uh, to get ourselves down there by biking and to carry all the components we were exhibiting at the Maker Fair on our bikes, uh, which meant some very heavily loaded cargo bikes. And this was a good chance for us to test um, dual wheel drive setups where we have combinations of uh, a direct drive hub motor and, in this case, a mid drive motor. So I've got a fair bit of experience doing this. And, uh, and I really wanted to share a lot of that experience with the, uh, the whole community here in this setting. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, so first thing to get across on this front is uh, why would you use multiple motors versus one hub motor? And it's really, really important to drive home that if there is a single hub motor solution or, or a non-hub motor, a single motor that will do the job, almost for sure it's gonna be more efficient, lighter, cheaper and simpler to hook up and set up than running dual motors. Dual motors isn't a go-to thing because it's better than one motor. You have to have other reasons that, that are calling out or necessitating running extra motors because it is a lot of extra work and a fair bit of extra complexity um, building the initial setup. This can be illustrated a little bit with this photo on the right here, which is uh, something a, a customer sent to us in an email on a not totally unrelated thread um, where he had sort of hacked and modified two bionic stators to be mounted side by side on the same axle trying to get like a double power bionics motor um, but looking at this you can see if this was a single motor twice as wide you wouldn't have all of this end turn copper on the inside the current would just flow straight across the store all the current flowing through here is kind of generating extra heat without any extra torque and you'd also have in two motors two side cover plates per motor. So you'd have the mass of four side plates versus if you actually made a single wide motor, the mass of only two side plates. So you can see how splitting one big motor into two smaller motor results in an increase in mass and an increase in the uh, copper winding losses. And so hence a little bit less efficiency. Um, so as a rule, one single big motor that's twice the power of two smaller motors should be lighter and more efficient. Um, and so you need to keep that in mind. Um, the reasons for multiple motors isn't just because it's cool or it's better. Um, but there are some really valid reasons for wanting more than one motor in an e-bike drive. Um, and the single most common uh, would be power. Uh, and so without a doubt, you know, probably 80%, 90% of the two-wheel drive or three-wheel drive systems we do, it's because a single motor just doesn't have the power 
and there isn't the space or the ability or just the availability for a larger motor that has that kind of power level requirement. Um, so obviously the e-bikes and the, or sorry, the motors, the controllers, the components available for our e-bikes are generally sized with the idea of the weight of one person and the kind of loads that a bicycle entails. Um, as soon as you have massive amounts of cargo, the weight of two or more riders, there's a lot of party bikes or social bikes that you see um, for kind of novelty reasons, like the, the common beer, beer bikes where you kind of, you know, sometimes eight or 10 people riding the same vehicle that still has pedals and is still considered in some class to be a bicycle, but no way one standard motor is going to do much for a vehicle with 10 people on it. Um, and also cases where it's just a normal rider, a heavy rider, but the hills are just so steep that the single motors that are available in the market don't have the capacity to do that kind of movement without risk of overheating and burning up. Um, and so why don't we just make bigger, more powerful motors for these applications? Well, there's, you know, one, they could, and there are big and powerful motors, but within the context of an e-bike, there's a bit of a limited real estate that we have available to fit the motor. Um, and you can see that in this drawing on the right here. So in a, on a standard bike, that has got a full drive chain with all the gears, has disc brakes on the left. You have this spacing in which the motor needs to fit, which is 135 millimeters across. And that's decently wide. That's room for a big, powerful motor. Um, but then you need to reserve quite a bit of that. So you need you know, almost 25 millimeters or, or 28 millimeters actually, um, just to fit a disc caliper. So the disc brake will mount in the right location and then has enough room not to rub against the side cover over here. And obviously on the right-hand side, assuming you have a full drivetrain, then you need the room for the cassette cluster. Um, and that only leaves you with, you know, something more like 60 to 70 millimeters, uh, uh, maybe more like, yeah, I think it's about 60 millimeters um, of actual width for the motor, um, but that's the outside width. By the time you take into consideration the thickness of the side plates, geometric clearances so things don't rub the side cover, reinforcement ribs, and just the thickness and width of the end turn, it means that in practice, it's really hard, at least for direct drive motor, um, to have more than 30 millimeters of width on the stator. And so then the only way to get it more powerful would be to increase the diameter of the motor, um, which is something you've seen. So you'll, you'll see like the, the some of the uh, golden motors run a 273 millimeter rather than a 205 millimeter stator diameter. Um, uh, but yeah, mostly it's not super easy to make one motor that's in this next tier of higher classes. And as a result, the easiest go-to solution for people to electrify their vehicle and get a totally different class of torque requirements is just to run multiple motors um, that are in the family that does fit on a bike. Um, so here's an example. This is a, uh, a guy, David Elderton, who runs an e-bike business on Salt Spring Island, and he does local deliveries and pickups and service and support of the bikes that he sells and provides. So that often means carrying around quite a few uh, hundred pounds of bikes in the trailer. And if you've been on the Gulf Islands here, you know they're also notoriously hilly. Um, uh, and so the only way for him to make a vehicle that can allow these kind of local deliveries via e-bike was to have multiple motors. Here he's got one motor in the trailer wheel itself, and he has his second motor as a hub motor in the back of the e-bike. Um, and between both of those solutions, he then has enough torque to, uh, to make this a practical vehicle. Um, so anyway, so power is the, the single main cause or the main justification for getting a, a higher power class or ha having the need for two motors or three motors on a bike. Um, there's another thing uh, uh, where it can be of significant consideration and that's just having redundancy. Um, so this was a real factor for um, myself and my partner when we did the Sun Trip bike ride two years ago. Um, I really get nervous about having all eggs in one basket for any technical components. Um, so I, uh, as a habit, would always carry backup gear. If you have two motors on the bike, you have intrinsic redundancy in there without the redundancy being dead weight on you. Um, so in this case, we have a, a customer, Michael, who's building a uh, touring recumbent bike that he's planning to take on a ride up the Dempster Highway to the, to the Arctic. Um, so he's going, I think it's 7,000 kilometers or so in total, but now he's spanning massive, beautiful lengths of countryside uh, where there's no hope at all of getting any kind of assistance or help or support if the uh, system fails. Uh, so in his case, he went for two hub motors on the bike. 
um, and then has a trailer that's loaded up with a total of 10 52 volt batteries. So he can be autonomous and self propelled uh, for enormous lengths. And here in this case, the dual motors gives a little security that if there is a system failure, it's very unlikely both motors would fail at the same time, even though one motor won't quite be enough power. It's not as enough power as you'd really ideally want for a system this heavy towing all those trailers. It's still much, much easier to limp along and continue your trip where you still have one motor available uh, versus none. Um, so yeah, so for people doing bike touring trips and touring travels, there's a, an inclination or desire for two motors just to have one be a built-in backup. Um, and there's another case which relates to traction applications. And so I alluded to this in the introduction about that uh, tricycle that the uh, customer in France built with the three fat bike uh, wheels on it. Um, in off-roading cases, you're quite often having many of the motors unloaded or you're climbing grades that are so steep that there's no single motor that could give the traction needed to move forwards. Uh, if you have quad vehicles with four wheels, uh, depending on how the suspension's done, quite often you're, you'll have scenarios where only three of the four wheels are really bearing any weight. So if we only electrified one of the two wheels of this quad bike, one of the two rear wheels, uh, there's a good chance when you're going over gnarly room that that one wheel would get lifted off the ground and not be able to actually push the vehicle forward anymore and you'd get stuck. Um, but having both motors, both rear motors driving ensures that at, all, at any point, you're always gonna have at least one motor with weight contacting the ground. Um, and then the last reason that sometimes comes up isn't uh, a necessity like that, uh, but a case where the nature of the vehicle itself leaves that as pretty much the only viable option. And this happens a few times uh, with these Christiana style cargo trikes. Um, so in these trikes, you have a pivot on the front. Um, and so when you have a motor on the front of these things, the motor can produce a steering component. And if you're gonna do a front wheel electrification, it's vitally important that both front wheels are electrified and producing more or less the same torque. Otherwise you'd always be fighting the uh, the motor torque causing the handlebars to steer on you. So if you have a, a tricycle of this nature, but the back end is already committed to an internal gear hub with a belt drive or something where installing a rear hub motor isn't really viable, then uh, two motors may be the only solution, not, even, not necessarily because you need the power, but just because that's what the geometry dictates is the only possibility. Um, and there's other cases where it's done a little bit for aesthetics. So this bike on the left here, um, with somebody who liked the look of the tiny geared hub motors. Um, and uh, so even though one larger geared motor like the GMAC would have the same power as these two small ones, um, it then looks like a big obvious hub motor, but two really little discrete motors can give you the power benefits of a bigger hub motor drive uh, while keeping the aesthetic cleanliness of tiny motors. Uh, in this case, the photo is also taken in the snow where you get the benefit of dual wheel drive traction as well. Um, but that can be another justification for doing a dual motor setup. Uh, so getting, getting the power without having a visual bulk of a big motor. So uh, that's some of the reasons why you should get it, why you may be following this thread or have an interest in the dual motor system. Uh, what I'm going to do for the next little bit is quite a deep uh, technical look at comparing the performance of a one motor versus a two motor drive and trying to understand what the trade-offs are in that and how to pick and choose the best combination of motors for what you're trying to do. Um, not only choosing the right motors, but also choosing how best to drive the two for the best net vehicle efficiency. So in this case here, what I'm gonna do uh, a little comparison in is having, I'm using exactly the same motor model that I used in the presentation a few weeks ago where we did a, a deep technical um, explanation of how brushless or permanent magnet motors work. Um, and so it's exactly the same, you know, 10 RPM per volt, 0.3 ohm winding resistance. Um, and we'll step through using, you know, the same equations as was done back then. So if you did follow the presentation previously, um, and it'd be, this will uh, come naturally. If you haven't seen the previous one, it might be good to uh, check back in on that last talk and review that. Cause then when I'm jumping into these numbers, they'll have a little bit more context and familiarity to you. Um, but in general, if you have two motors, two identical motors versus one motor, it's electrically exactly the same as having one single motor, 
where the resistance of the windings is just half as much. So it'd be like a, a new motor model where we're 0.15 ohms instead of 0.3 ohms. Um, but it also being twice the size has double the core losses. So in the motor example that we used at our understanding hub motor presentation, I used uh, made an assumption that the motor had a core loss of 0.1 watts per RPM. So if it's spinning at 100 RPM, there's 10 watts of heat that's being generated just to change the magnet magnetization and induce eddy currents inside the stator. Um, and uh, if we were to model a dual motor, we would have to double that value to 0.2 watts per RPM. So for a double motor setup, if we're spinning at 100 RPM, we'd have 20 watts of heat being generated inside. Um, but being double the size, at, we'll also have you know double the thermal mass and as two separate motors, you have double the heat conductivity to shed that heat outside. Um, so if you were to do, if you wanted to do a simple model of what the performance of a dual motor system would look like, but your modeling tools only lets you model one motor, you can take the motor that you had in mind, cut the resistance in half, double the core loss terms, um, and then that modeling tool would give you an expected output for the dual hubs. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just compare. We're going to have this hypothetical situation where we're, we're, we're riding a bike with this, this motor that we made with 10 RPM per volt and 0.3 ohms. And we're going to see how the comparison, how the performance compares when we have just one of these motors on the bike or if we have two of them on the bike. So when you're running at a high power situation, um, you know, say, say, you, you, say you need a certain amount of torque uh, for, to move the bike up a given grade hill. If you have two motors doing that, then each motor only needs to provide half the torque. Um, but from your understanding of hub motors, half the torque means exactly half the phase current flowing through the motor windings. And as we know from our understanding of electronics, if we have half the phase current, in this case, 20 amps versus 40 amps, that results in one quarter the amount of copper losses or heat generated from copper losses inside each motor winding. So here in this uh, single motor case, let's assume that we're going up a hill that needs 38 Newton meters of torque. Um, using the same sequence of events I did last time, we can calculate that the uh, motor is going to slow down to 240 RPM. It'll be generating 24 volts of uh, back EMF voltage um, for a resulting 40 amps flowing through the motor windings. Um, and with 40 amps flowing, that results in 40 squared times 0.3 or 480 watts of power being formed just as heat inside the copper. Um, because the motor is spinning, it's spinning at 240 RPM and has core losses, the core losses at that speed are going to be 24 watts. Um, so our total amount of power that we're losing inside the hub is 480 plus 24 or um, 504 watts of heat that we're generating. Now we can compute the efficiency of the motor uh, knowing how much electrical power is uh, mechanical power is coming out of the motor, um, which you can figure out is 936 watts. Um, so our efficiency is 936 watts divided by 36 times 40, so 1440 watts of input power, or 65%. Now, 500 watts of heat generated inside the motor is an enormous amount of heat. So your, your typical space heater that you use to warm up a uh, room in the cold wi winter might be a kilowatt. So it's like having half of a space heater inside the small confines of the motor. And pretty much every single motor that we have ever dealt with or seen for an e-bike would absolutely cook if you sustain 500 watts. You'd be able to, 500 watts of heat. You could do 500 watts for short term just fine, and the motor will warm up as it's being exposed to that. But it'll never sustain 500 watts. Um, there's no motors in our catalog that could just shed 500 watts without the core getting to a point that's going to damage the, the copper. Um, so now if we do that exact same analysis, but we have a motor producing only half the torque, um, we can see we only need 20 amps flowing through the stator. Stepping through the same set of equations gives us, uh, as I said, it was going to be one quarter the amount of copper losses. So instead of 480 watts, we now have 20 squared times 0.3 or 120 watts. Um, and uh, obviously it's only, uh, I shouldn't say, <laughs> um, it's, because there's less current flowing through here, uh, the, there's less voltage drop across the winding. So the motor is actually able to spin at a higher speed while producing 20 amps. So instead of the motor being slowed down to 240 RPM, it now actually has a faster clip of 300 RPM. Um, 
the output power of each motor is 570 watts. So combined, we have 1140 watts. Um, the efficiency of the motor running just 20 amps is now a fair bit higher, 570 watts over 720 watts of input power is 79%. Um, but most importantly, the heat generated inside the hub, now our copper losses are one quarter of much. Our core losses are a little bit higher um, because we've, um, we're spinning the motor at a slightly higher speed because it's able to, to move faster when it's generating less torque here. Um, but it's only 150 watts. So you can see that that's not, it's in between three and four times less heat that the motor has to shed. And 150 watts is a kind of power level that most of the motors that you see in a bike can shed indefinitely without any worry of them overheating. At 150 watts, a hub motor will get quite hot, um, you know, to the tune of 100, 110 degrees Celsius. Um, but it's not something that will result in inevitable failure if you continued it for too long. Now, this is the analysis of just one motor. The total consumption, of course, is double that. So the total amount of copper loss is 240 watts, not 480 when you factor it over both motors. And that's exactly what you'd expect um, based on the previous slide where you have exactly half the resistance for the effective single motor that emulates both motors. Um, so you can see then that switching from one motor to two motor has a massive and dramatic effect on how safe a motor is going to be when it's in this high loaded application. And here's a, a real world example of that. Um, when we were building our tandem trike uh, for the sun trip, I first started uh, doing my test prototype run with a single hub motor in the rear. Uh, so we put a Muxus direct drive motor in here. Um, and I was, you know, I was mostly testing the mechanics of the rowing rig, um, the solar panels, other systems. So I wasn't too concerned if it wouldn't be able to go over the Alps that we were going to encounter um, on the sun trip race itself. Uh, but we found is that even just the hills in Vancouver, and we're talking climbing a couple hundred meters at most, um, was causing the motor to overheat and the whole system to go into thermal rollback. And it actually wasn't all that fun taking it on local trips because of the of frequency with which that one motor um, would heat up and my control system would then reduce the power, um, slowing us down and requiring more pedaling and rowing effort in order to maintain a decent clip. Um, when we did the actual sun trip, uh, we had two hub motors in the front, um, direct drive motors of a similar nominal size and dimensions. And with the two motors, uh, we were able to do 2000 meters climbing up through the, um, through the Alps and just barely hit 100 degrees is the hottest our motors ever got. Um, so it shows what a, a dramatic difference that can meet, that can produce. So here uh, you can see exactly the same things if you use our motor simulator tool. So here I've got the, the Muxus direct drive motor that we had on the sun trip trike. Um, figure we're somewhere around uh, 200 kilograms for both me, my wife, the weight of the heavy vehicle, the solar panels, all of that gear. Um, uh, just a marginal 100 watts of power from both of us. Um, but with this system, if we're climbing a 6% grade hill, which is not crazy steep, that's a, around the grade you have and you just have a long steady uh, pass or a windy road going up a mountain. Um, but you can see the prediction is that the steady state temperature of the motor would reach over 170 degrees Celsius. Um, and that's a temperature that would cause the grease to sort of smoke out of the ball bearings um, and could uh, burn off the insulation. It could certainly melt the sheathing that covers the uh, cable that goes in through the axle of the motor. So without some kind of rollback, um, this could spell a bit of a disaster. So this makes it seem like such a no brainer. Well, definitely use two motors. They run more efficiently, you'll have less consumption. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so sorry, and then I, <laughs> I wanted to, um, yeah, jump in here. So now we do the pre precisely the same simulation. Um, and just so you guys know, uh, for each one of these uh, examples that I've done on the uh, simulator, I have the link that will open that exact same simulation for you. So when this presentation is done, I'm gonna go through um, and uh, post a copy of the presentation slides and also an update the, the comments in YouTube to have all these links. So if somebody wanted to play with the same values and then move the cursor around and then change the percent grade hill, um, they'd have this, the launching point. That's the same example that I've got here in this presentation. So with here, what, one of the, the features that we added to our motor simulator a couple of years ago was the ability to not only compare two different motor systems at once, but to add them together so that you see the combined output from both these motors. So here we have exactly the same setup uh, as in the previous slide, but I've added another motor, the same motor, same battery pack, same configuration for wheel diameter and motor controller. 
Um, and then it gives us an output of a, a combined both systems. And you can see now that the same 6% grade climb is going to reach a steady state motor temperature of 67 degrees, which is not even warm to the touch for, for a hub motor. And that's climbing, you know, a 200 kilogram or, or almost 450 pound vehicle up a 6% grade. It would just handily do that nonstop day and night. Um, and while doing that, uh, achieves a fair bit higher motor efficiency. So now we're 84% efficient on the motors versus 76% um, or 77% with the single hub, much cooler final temperature. Interestingly, you would have thought, oh, well, since the motors are running more efficiently, then I'm gonna use less battery and have better watt hours per kilometer. Um, you'll notice that the watt hours per kilometer in both these simulations is identical. Uh, the reason for that is that with two motors, we're able to climb that hill faster. Uh, so we're now moving along at 28 instead of 24 kilometers an hour. So there's more air drag to overcome. And it also means that for the same amount of human power input, we are using less human power per given distance that we travel. It's the same 200 watts, but we're moving further with dual motors in a given time period um, than we are with one motor. So the net amount of human watch that's contributing to climbing up this hill is less. And that means a larger share, again, is being done by the motors instead of our muscles. So the simulation results in exactly the same watt hours per kilometer, but that's because we've used more of the motor to climb the hill um, and we've had more drag climbing at a faster speed, causing those two numbers to come out the same. Um, so yeah, so that seems like definitely a no brainer to put two motors on advantages in every single metric. But now I wanna look at what happens when you're running two motors at a low power level. Cause when you're on a bike trip or an e-bike trip, you're not always climbing up a 6% grade. On average, you'd hope your trip is 0% grade. There's downhill sections. Um, and here, let, we'll look at this, um, but now let's look at having a situation where we only need 10 or nine and a half Newton meters of torque. So this would be pretty representative. 10 Newton meters is about what a motor outputs when you're just cruising along at the flats using a couple hundred watts. Um, so here with one motor, uh, we can run through that same set of computation with just 10 amps flowing. There's uh, more voltage across the motor versus being lost across the winding resistance. Uh, so the vacuum after the motor will be 33 volts while it's spinning at 330 RPM. Um, and the copper losses with just 10 amps, and this is where that I squared term for heat generation really becomes pretty dramatic. We've now gone from 480 watts of copper loss in the last simulation to just 30 watts when you only have 10 amps flowing through. Um, so that's even slightly less than the core losses in the motor. Um, and so we can compute the total output power and the final efficiency, which works out to be about 83%. And now we're only producing 63 watts of power of heat to dissipate in the motor, which is not an issue whatsoever. Um, now let's look at that uh, situation of light loading with dual motors. And so with two motors now, each motor only needs to do four and a half Newton meters of output rather than uh, nine and a half Newton meters. So that means five amps instead of 10 amps of phase current. Uh, that'll allow the motors to spin even a little bit faster. So we will now be moving at 345 RPM instead of 330. So the dual motor system will be going a little bit faster. Um, that higher speed means that we have a little bit more core loss uh, inside each motor, um, but our copper loss is now super low. So at five amps, we only have seven and a half watts, which you won't even notice seven and a half watts inside something as big and heavy as a hub motor. Um, but the total losses from both motors, when you add the 34 watts of copper and the seven and a half watts of core losses, that's 49 and a half watts per motor, which is less than this one, but we have two motors. So now we actually have in total 100 watts of heat that we need to get through. It's nowhere near gonna cause any concerns with overheating the motor, but it does start to drop our efficiency. So now our, our net efficiency with this load shared over two motors at low torque outputs is just 77%. Um, and you can see that. So with the with our simulator using the exact same parameters as we had in the last time, I've switched it to a 0% grade instead of climbing a 6% grade, but I've still left us as a really heavy 450 pound vehicle. Um, and it surprised me a little bit to see this too, but even with the 450 pound vehicle like this, um, if we ran just one hub motor, you can see that we're rerunning that motor at close to 84% efficiency um, uh, using uh, just over seven watt hours per kilometer. 
Um, if we switch that to the dual motor system on the trike still riding on totally flat ground with a 0% grade, um, the motor efficiencies drop to 76%, almost exactly the same kind of numbers that we showed in the numeric analysis for a totally random motor and just guesstimated values. Um, and, uh, and so here you see that it would have actually been better um, when if most of our trip was on flat ground and the hills weren't actually going to uh, be long enough to cause the motor to overheat, we might be better off just with one motor overall that our, our net um, consumption and the, the, the times when the efficiency is higher are outnumbered the times when the efficiency is lower. Um, so here the temperature heating of the motors is just a non-factor either way. Two motors are slightly cooler, 40 degrees instead of 42. Um, but the two motor system has a higher consumption um, and, uh, and that's a downside to two motors uh, and having both motors running. So the kind of obvious question is, okay, well, that's pretty clear cut. There's no point running both motors when you only need a small power output. So why don't we just turn on one of the motors and not the other motor? And that way we can run the motor at, um, at its higher efficiency with this lower power level. Sure, uh, so here we've got the same two direct drive hub motors and our simulator lets us do all those things. So if we wanna simulate only one motor being active um, at this speed, what I've done is I've, I've converted this second motor system B um, to a, a standard voltage controller and just set the throttle really low. So you can see here at the very low speeds, you can see the power output of both motors being present, but all the way over here, um, we're doing the simulation with only one motor running. And now you can see that System A, the motor that uh, is doing all the work, is at that same 84.5% efficiency as we had with the one motor simulation. But System B, the motor that we're not driving, it's not that it's just out of the picture. It actually has negative 27 watts of power. It's absorbing power that the other motor has to push through. So even though this motor is putting out 212 watts, 27 of those watts is getting absorbed by the second motor that we're not running. So the net effect is that there's only 185 watts pushing the vehicle because you know almost 30 of those watts is going uh, just to turn the motor that we thought we turned off. And when you factor that into account, you're right back down to where we were before with this 74% net efficiency. So there's absolutely no gain. Uh, it's actually, it's even a little bit worse. Um, and that's because when you have two direct drive motors, when you turn it off, you're not dropping the power to zero watts, you're going negative. The core losses are still present, whether or not you're trying to drive the motor. And all you've done by moving your power to one hub instead of both is put all your copper loss into one. And because the copper loss goes as a square of the current, you've now added more total uh, motor losses than um, when you had that copper split over both of them. The core losses are the same, the copper is a bit higher, and the effect is an even worse net efficiency. All right, so that's the situation with dual direct drive hub motors. Um, uh, if you have two direct drive motors in the setup and that you're doing that because of these reasons where you need the, the torque and power capability of dual motors, um, you have core losses in both hubs. And as a result, um, it never makes sense to power just one motor. Um, you always, always want to share the power equally between both motors. And if the motors are different sizes, so say you have a, a big, 50 millimeter stator on the rear motor and a 35 millimeter on the front motor, um, the most efficiency is to split that power that you deliver to the motors by the same ratio of their you know, motor bulk or motor size. Um, so in this case, you'd sort of do about 60% of power in the rear, 40% in the front, but you would keep that ratio over your whole speed range. Uh, it never makes sense to think, oh, now I'm doing a big climb, I'm gonna switch only to the rear motor, the, the bigger motor, and okay, now I'm cruising on the flats, I don't need much power, I'm only gonna use the smaller, more efficient front motor, um, you always want to share both motors, share the load to both motors. Um, so when you're doing a dual motor system with two direct drive motors, um, you, uh, yeah, it never makes sense to run just one. You always run them both together at the same time. And when it comes to the choice of the motors, ideally, if it's the same wheel diameter, you can use the same motor series and then have exactly the same KV winding speed. Um, if you have a motor that's, uh, a wheel that's smaller than the other motor, then ideally you'd get a, a motor winding for that smaller diameter wheel that's faster, that has a higher RPM per volt, so that they have similar unloaded speeds. Uh, so your RPM per volts aren't gonna match, but your kilometers per hour per volt, um, the 
is going to be approximately the same. I'm going to go into uh, an explanation later on on the importance or not importance of matching the KVs exactly this way. Um, and, uh, uh, and it obviously makes sense with dual motors that you definitely never want to have a situation where one motor is doing regenerative braking while the other one is powering it. And this is something that can happen if you have two direct drive motors and one's got a substantially faster winding than the other. Um, once you get to the speed where the other one is no longer able to contribute, it's beyond the unloaded speed, it'll start absorbing energy doing regen, which the faster motor has to then overcome. And you're just completely wasting energy circulating between the two motors that way. Um, so this was a, a dual motor um, e-bike uh, that I, when I did a cross Canada bike trip quite a while ago, we'd had various meetups along the way. And one of the guys at the meetups had done his own two wheel drive system um, using the old 400 series crystallite motors that were sort of the popular motor of the era. Um, so now I'm going to talk about a different tack for dual motor setups, and that's to use one geared hub motor and one direct drive hub motor. And this arguably is a better, if it's an option for you, it's a better approach on the whole, because you end up having the choice, having the benefit of, of an advantages of geared and direct drives in the same setup. So geared motors generally have good efficiency at those high torque and lower speed situations where the direct drive motors um, tend to drop off quite a bit in the efficiency curve. Um, but the direct drive motor means that you still have a hub motor that can do regenerative braking, so you can capture all the regen energy when you're going downhill and when you're stopping. Uh, but the benefit of having the one geared motor system is that I'm, when, I, when I use the term geared motor throughout this presentation, I'm talking about a geared motor with an internal freewheel. So obviously a GMAC motor or any geared motor that was modified not to have a clutch is in the class of a direct drive motor uh, for the sake of this presentation here. Um, the benefits of, of one geared and one direct drive is that when you want to run just one hub motor, if you run the direct drive motor and you don't put any power in the geared motor, it freewheels without any drag on the system. There's no core losses present. The motor actually stops spinning. And that means that that analysis that I just did of running one motor versus running both motors um, no longer holds. Uh, when you run just the one motor, you don't have losses caused from the other motor, and you can have a better efficiency switching over to being single motor at those lower torque situations, and then running both motors only when uh, your situation requires it, and that's whenever you're dealing with medium or high power levels. Um, so if you're doing a system with a geared and direct drive motor in combination, your ideal use is, um, is to share the load between both motors whenever the motor, the power levels are, are medium to high, um, switch to only the direct drive motors at lower power levels. And in those situations, should you run the geared motor, but not power up the direct drive motor? Because then the geared motor is overcoming the losses of this other hub, um, and you're going to be worse total efficiency. Um, another thing to note is that uh, for the same power class motor, direct drive motors uh, tend to have higher winding resistance than a geared motor. Um, so when it comes to sharing, how would I split the load between a geared and a direct drive motor here? Um, the best result is not to split that load evenly between them, even though both motors have the same nominal power. It's a, a bit of an improvement to have a higher share going to that geared motor when you're doing these higher power levels. Um, so here I can illustrate that again with a, a simulation example. Um, and this is uh, basically the same setup that Robbie had on this bike here. We've got the easy motor in the back and the direct drive grin hub, version one grin hub on the front. Um, and here I, what I've done is I've superimposed um, both curves. I haven't added the two systems. We're showing them independently. And this highlights what I was talking about here. So system one is the easy motor, um, which is in a 20 inch wheel. Um, so it has the additional advantage that it's in a smaller size hub um, to compensate for the smaller wheel size, we've used the faster RPM motor option. Um, and, uh, and you can see that it has sort of an unloaded speed of about 52 kilometers an hour. Um, the efficiency of this easy motor and the power output, I'm running with exactly the same uh, motor control or the same battery voltage. It does way better than the direct drive motor when we're heavily loaded doing high power outputs. The efficiency, even when we're you know, generating 40 plus uh, Newton meters of torque, or, or sorry, pounds of thrust is the axis here, um, is upwards in the 70, above 70% 70 realm with a direct drive motor producing those same heavy uh, torque outputs um, is running more like 50% efficiency. Um, 
But the direct drive motor, you notice, has a higher peak efficiency when we're at lower power levels and lighter loads. Um, this isn't just a high speed situation. So this, this whole graph would be the same if I was to reduce the throttle on both of those so that I'm running, say, 30 kilometers an hour, we still have the same scenario where the direct drive motor would have a higher peak efficiency um, and then the easy motor would have a better efficiency as the torque and the load start to increase and we slow down further from our unloaded speed at that throttle voltage. Um, so, um, so if we were to have this set up and run, share the power to both motors exactly the same way, the easy motor would be doing swimmingly well at these really high loads while the direct drive would be running pretty poorly. And here we could trade off, we could run, put a little bit more of that, that current share into the easy motor, which will reduce its efficiency, but increase its power. And then we could reduce the amount of power going into this direct drive hub, which would boost its efficiency, but it would boost the efficiency of this much more than the efficiency of the easy motor went down um, for a net better um, output. Um, so here you can see what the comparison curves look like. Uh, where I've switched it up so that the easy motor is running a 50 amp uh, maximum phase current, and then the direct drive motor is a 25 amp phase current. And you can see we're now much closer matched um, uh, when, we, when we share the load here, or when we're running at these higher power points. The easy hub is doing more of the work, um, but the direct drive motor is now running better efficiency and the overall net efficiency would be better with this kind of a ratio split of the power. Um, that brings us to uh, another dual motor situation where you use a combination of one mid drive and one hub motor. And this really is the best of best of all worlds for uh, scenarios you can envision for running a dual or a triple motor system. Um, because not only do you have a direct drive motor that can do regenerative braking, capture all of your stopping and your downhill power, um, you have a mid drive motor that allows for the absolute best efficiency when you're doing those really steep hill climbs where the bike has to slow down quite a bit. Um, and the mid drive motor, just like the geared hub motor, has no drag losses, no core losses when you're not powering it. So just like the last situation, uh, and a dual motor system is like this, you want to use the direct drive motor whenever you're running low powers um, and then switch to both the mid drive and uh, and the hub motor, the direct drive hub motor at high power levels. Um, but determining how to optimally share power between your direct drive motor and the mid drive motor is quite tricky uh, because the optimal split will depend on exactly what ratio you have for your gear ratio on the mid drive motor. Um, and just as with the geared and direct drive situation, you, I say, and I say never, I mean, obviously you can do this, but it doesn't make uh, system sense in order to run power up the mid drive motor and not have the direct drive motor powered at the same time. Um, so some people have an existing mid drive bike, but it's kind of too slow for the hill climbs. They need more power. They want more power. So they think, hey, can I add a hub motor to my system? Um, but the, a common presumption of people doing that is that, oh, well, mid drives are really efficient. So, you know, I'm only going to have the hub motor kick in when I'm doing the hill climb. And otherwise, the mid drive will be my default motor that's running all the time. Um, but when you do that, the mid drive will still be running efficiently at all those low power levels, but it now has to overcome the core loss of the direct drive motor. And the effect is that you'd have less net efficiency than if you <laughs> didn't run the mid drive and had all your low power efforts done through the hub motor instead. Um, and then that brings us to the last uh, situation that we've encountered, um, and that's running dual geared motors or dual motors that that freewheel. So this could also be a geared motor and a mid drive motor. Um, and in this situation, you lose the benefit of having regenerative braking. And so in a lot of situations, that means your overall mileage is going to be worse because you, you lack that sort of five to 10% recapture you can get from a regen system. Uh, but it might be the most ideal situation if you're doing a, a bike touring trip where you expect really long stretches with no motor power at all, then having a system where both motors freewheel means that you don't have any residual drag when you're pedaling the bike um, uh, without the motors helping out. Um, uh, and just like the analysis that I did for two, motor, two direct drive motors, in terms of optimal use of these motors, it makes sense to run just one motor when your power levels are low. And as soon as your power levels are medium to high, you want to split your load and run both motors together. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the motor winding speeds. Um, and this 
uh, is, a, is a very important design consideration when you're, when you're choosing the parts for dual motor system. And one of the most common mistakes that we hear people making is uh, thinking that they need to have one good low speed motor that's great for torque and another motor that's really great for high speed. Um, and then, you know, you'd switch over, oh, I've been climbing a hill, I'm gonna use my good low torque, I'm a good high torque slow motor, and now can I'm racing along, I'm gonna switch over to my fast motor. Um, there's pretty much never a case <laughs> where you wanna switch wholly from one motor to the other motor. It's always better when you're dealing with medium to high powers to share that power amongst two hubs so that the, uh, the copper loss gets to go down because of that I squared I squared R term. Um, a, a small reduction in copper loss is a, 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 of current is a large reduction of, of heat generation in each motor. Um, and so you you pretty much always want the ability to share the power between both motors regardless of your speed. The switch off between running one motor or running both motors is based on the torque requirement of the motor, not on the speed. Um, so you want to make sure that both motors can help you at any speed that you're traveling in case the torque requirement is such that you're better off splitting over to both motors. Um, and because of that, it really makes sense to, as best as you can, choose your motors to have the same unloaded speed. Um, if you can't do that, and it's often the case that given the, um, the nature of motors on the market, sometimes there's only one winding speed available. Um, sometimes, you know, they're discrete speeds. Typically, we only have you know, two winding speeds for each motor category, a, sl a standard and a fast, for instance. Um, the idea is that the fast motor in a 20 inch wheel is roughly the same as a standard motor in a 26 inch wheel. But what if you have a 16 inch wheel or you're running 700C or 29er sizes, you're not gonna get exactly the same unloaded speeds. Uh, when you're mixing wheel diameters or brands or models of motors, it's basically impossible to find two that have precisely the same top speed. Um, but, uh, I'm gonna to get to it in a little bit. Um, uh, with uh, with mo depending on your motor controllers that you use, matching them perfectly really isn't all that necessary. Um, but you can also use field weakening. So if you have a, a motor controller that has field weakening features, that can let you increase the speed of the slower system to match so that you never have a scenario where only one motor is able to provide power. They can both provide power right up to the top vehicle speed. So now we get into the uh, more challenging aspect of a dual motor system. And this is where a lot of our support inquiry comes in from, is now how do you actually wire up two motor systems? So all up to this point, I've talked about the optimal uh, running of dual motors, but not about how do you actually hook this up to make it feasible on a bike. Uh, so the most obvious approach to a dual motor system is just to have two totally independent setups. Um, so this bike that I showed you from the guy on the Cross Canada trip, he just had two throttles. There's a left-hand throttle bar and a right-hand throttle bar, and he could manually just control how much power is going to each motor. Now, his system with dual direct drive motors has no benefit to doing that. There's no case where you'd want to have more power in one motor than the other motor. So this is a silly approach. Not only is it extra taxing for the rider to think consciously about what's going on with both motor setups, um, but it also means that more often than not, he's going to be running less efficiently than if he just had one throttle and then split that throttle to both motor controllers. And that would ensure that both motors are always more or less running at the same power level. Um, so this situation of two independent systems, it does make sense or it might make sense if you already have a factory bike that has an integrated pedal torque sensor, the controllers inside the the motor chassis, there's no way to tap into wires to feed it on external throttle. Um, and that factory bike needs a secondary motor to supplement the power for the application that you have. Um, so you might think, okay, I'll just add a front hub to my, um, uh, to my e-bike and then I'll just have a separate throttle for the, with the front hub whenever I need it. And if your goal for the second motor is to have it be, you know, a boost or a helper on the hills, but not something that you're using all the time, then the inconvenience of having to remember to think about powering up the second setup um, isn't that big of an inconvenience. Um, so yeah, if you have a tightly integrated bike and you want to add a second motor, this may be really the only really viable option without some much deeper hacking of the electronics. Um, but for the most part, um, we really want to set up a dual or a multi-motor bike where there's a single control for the rider. The rider just has to say more power or less power and the system will automatically figure out how to uh, divvy up that power between the two or more motors that are on the bike. Um, now the 
approach that we've used uh, often enough, and we've uh, actually made as a product here a dual throttle splitter cable. So this we've had uh, for sale for, I think, over 15 years now because people have been doing dual motor bikes uh, for a long time. And effectively, we're doing, just as you see in this diagram here, we have one throttle going to the handlebar. And instead of that going just to one motor controller, we splice into the signal wiring and we split the signal, which is the green wire here, um, to go to two different plugs so that same signal goes to the throttle input of two different motor controllers. Um, you notice in this diagram that I'm not splitting the red wire, the five volt power, uh, between both of the um, uh, both of the, the controller plugs. Um, you could do that, um, and assuming both controllers are powered on, it's just fine. Uh, but you can wind up with some complications if one controller gets turned off, um, and that controller is getting five volts via the throttle line of the other controller. Um, if some models of controllers that can result in weird behavior. Um, in this, the, these controllers often just have a diode in line with the five volt output, which would make it harmless to share the five volts. Um, but as a general precaution, we've typically had this, when we split things, we kind of have one controller that's the dominant one supplying power to all the controls, and the other one only receives the signal back, but we're not sharing in parallel the five volts, the uh, power bus. Um, so this system, uh, if you have a bike that's just throttle controlled bike, that's all you need to do. You just split that throttle to both motor controllers. Uh, but most bikes these days are running with pedal sensors or torque sensors, some kind of pedalette control. Um, and if you want your pedaling efforts to split between two motor systems, then the setup ends up being a bit more complicated. So if you have a bike where the motor controller takes the pedal sensor directly, so almost all um, standard conversion kits that have pedal sensing, the pedal sensing input is just like the throttle plug of the controller. It's another plug that goes to the controller. The controller then reads those signals and determines how much power to send the motor. And it does that based often on the uh, input setting from a little display. You have a display to increase or decrease your assist level or go between eco, turbo, boost modes, whatever they want to call it. Um, and if you want to have two motors running, you can only have one pedal sensor on the bike or one torque sensor. Um, so you may be able to, just like we did with the throttle here, actually splice into the wiring of your pedal sensor and then split those signals to go to both motor controllers so they both receive the, the cadence pulses or the torque voltage. Um, but if you will have a setup where you control the assist level with the display, you would need two displays, one for each motor controller. You can't have one display of your, you know, your standard, you know, king meter style um, or topology or any of the displays with communication protocol to the controller. You can't have one display controlling two because there's back and forth communication between them. Um, the approach that we always dealt with, of course, is through um, our cycle analyst display, which works on a very different operating principle than a standard bike display, uh, where instead of the pedal sensors going to the motor controller, our pedal sensors goes to the cycle analyst. And the cycle analyst then does all of its own uh, feedback loops and, and controls to make its own signal uh, to regulate the motor controllers via just the throttle plug. Um, so at some point, as we started doing more and more dual motor systems, we uh, realized the need for um, dual motor systems that have pedal sensors, but also that have a display that shows the combined output of both motor controllers. So some people were actually mounting two separate cycle analysts on their bike to see what was going on for each system. Um, but for the most part, you just want to see on the whole, what's the net consumption. Uh, so what we made here was a dual controller CA shunt. Um, so this is the, the same shunt that we have for our standalone cycle analyst that plugs in between the battery pack and the motor controller. And inside this wiring, there's a precision one milliohm sense resistor that it able, it's able to sense how many amps are flowing from the battery. And that signal makes its way to the cycle analyst via this six pin cycle analyst plug. For the dual controller shunt, what we did is we took the throttle output signal um, from the cycle analyst and then we split that into two throttle plugs for each motor controller. So here's the six pin cycle analyst plug and then it goes to two three pin throttle plugs that plug into the controller's throttle input. Um, and then the battery current flowing through the shunt uh, goes, all of it uh, flows through one shunt resistor and then we split that also into a little Y split so that we had a separate battery plug for the battery input of controller one and the battery input of controller two. Um, so with this kind of setup, you have one display that's able to control and regulate both motor controllers 
with a pedal sensor input, uh, with a throttle input, and you get to see on your display the combined output power of both systems. And even if one, say, say motor controller two is set up to do half the current of controller one, the current flowing through the shunt is always the sum of those two. So it'll always very accurately and exactly show how many amps are being consumed from the battery pack for both systems. Um, so that was our go-to dual motor drive uh, solution uh, for quite a while. Um, but it has some inconveniences that you're not using the cycle analysis plug on the motor controller. As a result, you don't have the speed sensor passing through here. Um, you have this extra component to wire up in the system. Um, so last year, we started toying with the idea of doing a totally different approach. Um, and instead of doing a splitter cable on the throttle, uh, let's now split the cycle analyst plug. So instead of the site having one cycle analyst plug going into two throttles, it now goes into two cycle analyst plugs. Um, and that's what this cable here is. Um, so this system we've designed, this would work with the, this, the older JST connector for the cycle analyst, but we're now, um, as some of you are probably aware, switching our plug standard from JST to an eight pin HIGO connector. Um, and so the new version three cycle analyst, the CA3WP had this eight pin plug. And for people wanting to do a dual motor system now, all they have to do is plug in the Y splitter instead of the cycle analyst going straight to the motor controller. Um, it goes in through a splitter cable that now allows you to have two cycle analyst plugs to each motor controller. And internally here, um, there's eight pins uh, that link the motor controller to the cycle analyst. Some of those are being shared to both motor controllers. Um, so that would include the on off power switch. That would include, of course, the um, current sensor to sense how many amps are flowing across each of the internal shunts. Um, and obviously the throttle signal from the cycle analyst is split to both of these things. Um, but there's other signals in this plug that only come from one of the motor controllers. And that includes, for instance, the speed signal. So now if this controller has a speed pulse uh, coming from the hall sensors of the motor or coming from the internally generated pulse of the motor controller, that signal will make its way right through to the cycle analyst without you needing to hook up a separate speed sensor. Um, but you can only have one speed signal going to the cycle analyst. If both of them went at the same time, those signals would be conflicting because they wouldn't be in sync. Um, similarly, this new plug has the capacity to pass through a motor temperature. So if you have a motor hooked up with a temperature sensor in it, that signal will make its way through, um, through the plug straight up to the cycle analyst, but you would only get that temperature from one of the motors, not from both of them. So with this dual splitter cable, we basically have a piece of red heat shrink that identifies, you can see it here, which is the primary controller that has all the signals coming from it, and then which one is the secondary controller where you're not gonna see that info on the display. Um, so for the speed, it doesn't really matter. You only need to get the speed from one motor controller. For the temperatures, it would kind of make sense if you're doing this setup and you have two different classes of motor um, to have the primary controller be the one that's hooked up to the least, uh, to the most likely to overheat motor in your system. Um, with identical motors, you can always presume that the temperature of both motors will be identical. So you only really need to measure one temperature sensor from them. Um, this also is a benefit. One of the additional wires in the, the WP8 plug is the uh, on-off power switch. And so with this system, you can have a single on-off button on the handlebar and that will shut both motor controls and both setups on and off together um, instead of needing to turn, them, turn off each motor controller individually. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, um, one of the, the tricks to this system, and uh, anyone can DIY their own splitter cable for the cycle analyst plug. Um, here I've shown sort of the data sheet that we had to spec the cable, and you can see there's wires that split. So for instance, the green is a throttle signal that goes from one plug and also splits to the other plug. But where we split the current sensing for the controller shunt, so that's the blue and the yellow wires, we split them with these one ohm resistors in them. Um, and so the net effect of doing that is that the, the current sensing signal that the cycle analyst sees is more or less the average shunt voltage from each motor controller. Um, and when you tap into the existing controller shunts this way, you need to type in half the R shunt value of the cycle analyst for the cycle analyst to show the actual average current from both motor controllers. Um, so in the case of a phase runner and a base runner, those are one milliohm internal shunts. When you use a parallel connected splitter cable to have both controllers run to one cycle analyst, 
we're basically parallel connecting the shunts as well. And when you parallel connect two shunts of the same value, you have one shunt that's half the value. So in this case, when you use this cable, you need to make sure to set up the R shunt to 0.5 milliohms if it's phase runners or base runners. If it's a controller with you know, a five milliohm internal shunt, then you would set this to two and a half milliohms. Um, but it will work even if only one controller is running, um, it'll still show the actual, actual current from just one controller. So it's not assuming that both controllers draw the same power. If you have all your voltage drop across this controller and nothing across this one, because of this voltage divider with the resistors, you basically get half that shunt, uh, the voltage drop, making it to the cycle analyst. But because you've set your our shunt value to be one half, it ends up displaying the correct amount of current. Um, so uh, going forward, this approach here is going to be the main way that we suggest people run dual motor systems, because the hookup and wiring is pretty clean and simple. Um, and, uh, and it takes advantage of all the extra signals that are present in the CAW8 plugs here. Uh, so now we get to the point where I showed you in the earlier analysis that the, in, except in the case of dual direct drive motors, where you want a perfectly even split of power all the times in all situations, for the more uh, interesting scenarios of mixing mid drives and hub motors or geared motors and direct drive motors, um, you don't necessarily want the power to be shared equally, but you also don't want to be manually adjusting that split. Um, so when you have mismatched KV and, and diameter or, or wheel diameters, if you give exactly the same throttle signal to both motor systems, um, if you're using a conventional e-bike controller where the throttle voltage uh, or the throttle signal controls the voltage output of the, the voltage going to the motor, um, what ends up happening is that the faster motor does almost all the work. So if you split that throttle signal, but one motor has an unloaded speed of 40 kilometers an hour and the other one is, you know, 32 kilometers an hour, not massively different, that 40 kilometer an hour motor, if you go part throttle, it's gonna do all the work at 20 kilometers an hour. You give it a bit more throttle to go to 30, it'll be doing all the work at 30. Um, the only time when you would actually share it properly between both is when you go full throttle at low speeds and the motor controllers are limited by their battery current limit. Um, and, uh, and so that, that situation of a power split with mismatched KVs with generic motor controllers is really problematic. Um, there isn't an easy way to handle that situation. Um, the scenario or the, the solution to this is, is not to use motor controllers that have a voltage PWM throttle, but to use motor controllers where you have a current or an amp throttle or a torque throttle. So um, for instance, the, the field oriented controllers, the phase runner, base runner, when you give it part throttle, you're commanding a fraction of torque of the motor, not commanding the motor to spin at a given speed. Um, lots of other motor controllers, I think most of the Kelly controllers can operate as a current throttle instead of a voltage throttle. Um, when you run your systems with a torque based throttle, then when you give it the same throttle signal, the motor controllers will look after seeing that both motors produce the same torque or that they produce a different torque, but in the same ratio. Um, so torque based motor controllers make it infinitely easier to set up and design a dual or a triple motor system bike um, because you can play with that ratio of how much torque is generated for each throttle voltage and have it uh, automatically account for not perfectly matched uh, winding speeds and, and motor KVs. Um, so that makes it a big simplification to designing and setting up these kinds of systems. Um, so here, please work. Yes, great. Uh, so here I'm showing uh, what happens. So there, here I've got a setup with a typical um, um, voltage style of motor controller. And I'm just showing what happens when you vary the throttle with a voltage based motor controller. So this is at low throttles. As we increase the throttle, this is the power curve and the torque curve of the motor. We're basically just shifting this torque curve further, further to the right as our throttle level increases. So at a low throttle, there's tons of power at low speeds, but no power at high speeds. Um, and it's this portion of the curve that moves back and forth with the throttle voltage. Um, and uh, um, so here I'm gonna show the same example, um, but instead of, uh, I wait the animated GIFs, uh, <laughs> can't control when they start, so let's wait till this starts. But here I'm doing exactly the same motor, um, but now I'm using a controller that has a torque-based throttle rather than a voltage throttle. And this illustrates what part throttle means with a torque-based motor controller. So here you see I switch it, it's a torque throttle, not a voltage throttle. 
Now, when we simulate it, um, so we're going to run you know, from zero to full throttle, you'll see that at every single speed, we have torque. And as the throttle is increasing, we're just increasing the torque available at any given speed. Um, as you get up to your maximum throttles, the curves look identically the same. Um, but at part throttles, the behavior is really different with the voltage-based uh, throttle or a torque-based throttle. And this torque throttle has even torque no matter where you're at in the speed range. Um, and that means you can safely mis mix and match uh, setups that have different unloaded speeds. Um, so here again, I'll, I'll do a, a simulation example uh, back to that same one of uh, that we had where we had the 20 inch fast RPM easy motor and then the 26 inch direct drive motor in the front. Um, and you can see that this easy motor has a faster unloaded speed. So here we're at about 39 kilometers an hour, whereas a direct drive has an unloaded speed of about 35 and a half kilometers an hour. Not a huge difference, but clearly the easy motor in the 20 inch wheel is faster than this winding and 26 inch wheel. Um, and now I'm gonna uh, do that exact same simulation where we're running a voltage-based motor controller. Uh, actually, not, uh, not the quite the same simulation. So here what I've done is I've set it up for auto throttle and just shown you, if you pay attention down here, um, so now we're, we're adding up the two systems. So the, the geared and the direct drive motor outputs are being summed. Looking at the curve, it looks like a curve you'd expect. But if you look down at the actual motor power at any given speed, uh, let's let this start off from the beginning again. Um, you'll see that system A, the faster wind motor, is doing 300 watts. That's doing 30 watts, 400 watts, four, negative 14 watts. So you can see that at all of these speeds, um, almost all the work is being done by the easy motor. And the direct drive motor is doing nothing. It's actually generating drag um, because the unloaded speed is lower than what the bike is spinning at. Um, so clearly, uh, far from ideal situation, um, when you're running full throttle up a hill, it would then split itself OK because you'd be at the, the current limits. But in any normal modulation where you're, you're varying the throttle and you're not being current limited by the motor controller, you wind up with one setup doing all the work. And that's, as we showed earlier, much less efficient than splitting it between both hubs. Um, so now we uh, this illustrates what happens now where I've used, um, I've switched it from being a, a voltage-based controller to being a torque-based. And I've varied the ratio of phase current so that it's higher in the easy motor because the easy motor has less winding resistance. So I have 65 amps in the easy, 45 amps max phase current in the um, direct drive motor. And now you can see, um, yeah, so here you can see it's a torque based throttle. Um, as we move down at lower speeds where the throttle is adjusting, so you see that the throttle's, the throttle's voltage stays the same in all cases. Now you can see that the share of power is even more or less between both these motors. Um, so mo system A and system B are both producing equally over the whole range. The only place you didn't see that equal split was right at the start when I was close to the unloaded speed. And in this case, that's just because the, the direct drive motor is too slow. This, the geared motor is a higher unloaded speed. So at up in this range of the curve, it's really only the geared motor doing the work. But anywhere lower, it's now shared nice and equally. Um, so torque throttles uh, make for a, a kind of the only way to sensibly combine dual motors when the motor's unloaded speeds aren't matching. So that was one aspect of splitting the power that we discussed, you know, making sure that it's shared equally or roughly in ratio of the motor's power capability. Um, but the other thing that we talked about uh, for optimal, optimal usage was switching over from one motor driving to two motors. Um, and you know, I showed you that in any case where you have one of the motors in your multimotor system that has a built-in freewheel, it's advantageous at low powers to just not run that motor, and then you eliminate those core losses from the system performance. Um, and I do want to say that you really don't need to do this. There's no harm running all the motors equally. Yes, your consumption and efficiency, your consumption is going to be a bit higher. Your efficiency will be a bit lower when you're running at low powers, but um, that at low powers, if your efficiency is a bit lower, the net effect on your, your uh, battery usage or your range isn't really determined by those low power situations. It's mostly when you're climbing hills or using high power accelerating and whatnot. Um, so you don't need to, to refine the system so much that it switches from one motor to two motor automatically. But if you really do want to get the, the best out of it, or if you enjoy geeking out on this stuff, um, there are some 
uh, fun ways that you can use throttle mapping in order to automatically switch between one and two motors without any manual interventions and without doing some kind of advanced circuit or software that tries to choose when you should switch between one motor and two motors. Um, so in a motor controller like our the phase runner base runner suite, or phase runner and base runner, um, we can totally control the throttle map for each system. Um, so that determines at what voltage the torque starts to flow through the motor and at what throttle voltage you hit maximum torque. Um, and this allows for a, a really straightforward way of just customizing the throttle map for your two different setups so that in one system, here we have it so that the motor only starts to output when the throttle voltage gets close to two volts. Um, and our first system, system A here, uh, the motor starts to power at 1.1 volts. Um, so as you go with part throttle, only system A is gonna have any motor power going through it. System B, we're in the, the dead band zone. And then once we get to a point where we're commanding enough torque um, that uh, we think it's worthwhile to have both motors in the picture, above two volts, we now start seeing the second motor kick in. And then as you get to higher and higher powers, it then starts to share somewhat equally between the two of them. Um, so this isn't the, it's not the optimal arrangement. Ideally, there'd be a bit more of a step function here. Um, there is a trick to making a step function in the phase runner software that I, uh, uh, I unfortunately don't have a slide for it because of a glitch. Um, uh, but for now, know that you can do a throttle map like this um, to make that one to two motor transition just happen automatically. Um, and it only makes sense to do this, of course, when the second motor, the system over here, uh, freewheels. You would never do this when this is a direct drive motor or a geared motor with a lock clutch that's always engaged. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, one you know clever optimization that's possible uh, to still give you the simplicity of a single throttle and not having the user need to manually determine when to run both motors or one motor. Um, so this is the, the slide that, uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I was really looking forward to exhibiting here, but our, our website, as many of you probably know, this crashed at some point last night while I was in the midst of using the simulator and uh, it's still down at the moment, um, where I was going to show how you can use our motor simulator tool in order to find the optimal transition point when you should switch from one motor to two motors driving. Um, and effectively, this is, you can you know, imagine what the simulation is like. You simulate uh, with, uh, a single hub motor, and then you use the, the um, uh, simulation set and you increase the grade of hill from 0% to 20% or whatever, and you save that data to a spreadsheet. It, it outputs the data from the simulation set as comma separated values that you can paste in the spreadsheet. Um, and then you run that exact same uh, simulation set with two motors, and then the spreadsheet results of those two things, you can compare them, uh, superimpose the graphs, and then you see at what output the efficiency of one motor supersedes the efficiency of two motors. And then you look, what is my torque? What is the motor torque where that transition happens? And you would roughly choose that to be the point where dual motors kicks in instead of just one motor. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm a little bit bummed that I couldn't show you that process and the graph that comes from it. But if you're competent and familiar with our motor simulator tool, you should be able to figure out how to use the simulation set to determine that. Um, but even without doing that, you can do a pretty decent wild ass guesswork. Um, and honestly, in all the systems that we've built uh, running dual motors like that, I've never actually did the analysis beforehand. I just used what seemed about right from my gut feeling uh, on when it makes sense to switch over, um, usually somewhere around sort of 15, 10 to 15 Newton meters of torque. Um, and beyond that, um, you start having more dominant copper losses in the motor, and then you're, you're better off switching to to sharing those copper losses over two motors because uh, the copper losses are now more significant than the core losses. Um, uh, so yeah, so that really covers the, the whole meat of what I wanted to get at in this presentation. Um, there's a few other things that come up pretty often in terms of questioning. And one of them uh, relates to differential control. Um, so whenever you have a tricycle or a quad um, and you're steering or you're doing any cornering, the wheel that's on the outside spins faster than the wheel that's on the inside. And when you have a mechanical link drivetrain, um, so any kind of vehicle or any, you know, sometimes you have a tricycle where you pedal and it goes through a differential, you need a differential so that these torque producing motors can spin at different speeds. Um, if you don't have that, if you just have a fixed axis with both wheels spinning at the same speed and you corner, then either the outside motor skids or the inside motor skids and you end up wasting a fair bit of energy to tire friction. Um, and in a, in a mechanical linkage, differentials are 
critical. And that's probably why they're on lots of people's minds when we talk about dual motors. Um, with electric motors, there's no analogy to dual mechanically linked motors. It's absolutely no problem to have one motor spin faster than the other. Um, and there's no situations where you need to give separate control, separate throttle commands to the outside motor versus the inside motor, unless that's how you're actually steering the vehicle. <laughs> so if you're doing a system with tank steering, um, you know, a hoverboard is a perfect example where the whole steering is done by making one motor spin faster than the other. Um, but if you have a situation where your steering is mechanical, there's really never any situation where you want to independently throttle one motor more or less than the other motor. Um, so um, if you have a, a system with a, a torque-based motor controller, and this is what we generally advise for people doing dual motor systems, um, when you're cornering and the outside motor is spinning faster than the inside motor, um, the controllers ensure that both motors are producing exactly the same torque. Um, a motor that spins faster with the same torque is going to be producing more power. So if you were to actually look at the watts, there's going to be more watts flowing through the outside motor than the inside motor. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so what? <laughs> um, if you have, uh, conversely, um, a generic controller that has a voltage-based throttle, then when you're cornering, the inside motor is spinning slower than the outside motor. And when you slow down a controller that has a voltage-based throttle, the torque and the power of that motor increase. Um, so in this situation, you have the, the opposite scenario. As you're cornering, the inside motor has more power than the outside motor. Um, that's a little bit less ideal from a net efficiency perspective, um, but the uh, effect is, is small and insignificant um, unless you're riding in a perpetual tight loop circle. You'll never notice any actual difference in the, the consumption or efficiency by having you know, driven the outside motor at the slightly higher voltage than the inside motor. Um, for the most part, the relative speed difference when you're cornering is really, really small, unless you're going extremely slow, because um, most most corners are quite gentle uh, by and large. Um, so, so yeah, so the main thing is don't concern yourself at all with differential control for um, for inside and outside motors. Just share them. It doesn't really matter while you're cornering if one motor produces a little bit more power than the other, they're not gonna skid out. It's totally fine to have the, the speeds of the motors being different, even though they're getting the same throttle signal. Um, uh, but there can be an effect on steering when you have a system where a difference in torque on the motor actually causes the whole vehicle to steer. And this is really the case with these Christiana style cargo trikes. Um, and uh, which are uh, fairly popular and well served by dual motor drives. Um, but in a, in a situation uh, like this, you can clearly see that if one motor is producing more torque than the other, it's gonna help steer the vehicle a little bit. Um, and if you're using uh, torque based motor controllers, both motors produce exactly the same torque. And so while you're cornering, the fact that the outside motor produces more power is irrelevant. They're both producing the same torque and it has no effect on how it handles as you steer. Um, if you're using a voltage-based motor controller, then when you're steering, the inside motor is generating more power and more torque, and that tends to straighten out the handlebars a little bit, which is the kind of feedback that you want. So it's a little bit like when you're, when you're running under motor power and you're doing a sharp corner, you see a little bit more of a force just straightening the handlebars out, but it's nothing at all that really affects your ability to, to steer the vehicle. If anything, it gives a little bit of stability to the system. Um, when you have systems uh, like almost all, you know, uh, tadpole trikes or velomobiles, um, they generally steer both wheels uh, with a bar linkage rather than pivoting here. And the wheels, they pivot on the axis that's contacting the ground on the contact patch. So in a, in a tadpole trike with dual motors, um, you can run all your power on one motor and it just has no effect on steering whatsoever. This is just a unique thing when you're steering is a pivot point on the axle, on the axis between two side mounted motors. Um, um, but you do need to be really careful with this situation. If you are running a voltage based motor controllers that the motor controllers are identically matched have the same throttle response and that you're running motors that are perfectly matched as well. Um, so we ran into one situation with a, a friend of mine who has a, a business where she designs and, and makes um, Christiana style cargo trikes like this. Um, and because of the position of the disc brakes, um, it was the case that the motor on the second side gets, got flipped around. So it's flipped 180 
but it's still spinning in a forwards direction, which means the motor controller has to be running in reverse. Um, that's fine. We can have a forwards reverse switch on the motor controller, um, but these motors with hall sensors have uh, advanced timing on the hall. So the hall sensors don't behave the same when you spin forwards or when you spin backwards. Um, and that can result in a slight difference in the performance. They had slightly different unloaded maximum speeds, um, slightly different responses to throttle voltages you're getting up to speed. Um, and in that situation, even though they were nominally the same motor, because it was flipped and the hull advanced, the advanced hull timing was changed, it resulted in you being able to constantly feel a little bit of a steering push from the one motor that had uh, uh, a higher unloaded speed it wanted to go a little bit faster than the other one. So with torque-based motor controllers, you don't run into this as long as you ensure that they have the, the same throttle map. Um, but it's something to be mindful of with a, a more um, standard voltage throttle. Um, so that is where this slideshow comes to an end. So um, really, there's just three, <laughs> three things to drive home in this message, which is that um, if you are considering a multimotor drive system, uh, first to check that there isn't a single motor that will work just as well. Um, you need to have one of these reasons I covered in the whole int introductory section to justify the additional complexities and costs and uh, various penalties you have with the dual motor. Um, and really, if you're doing one in this day and age, just use a torque-based motor controller. It makes the splitting of the, the power, the ability to customize your throttle mapping of having one motor run at low, low powers and then both motors go in automatically at more high power. Um, all of that's so much easier to do with a, a, a more modern motor controller. Um, and for the best efficiency, you really want to just share the motors evenly. Don't think of having a slow motor for climbing hills and a fast motor for going on the flats. Really, um, ideally, you choose two motors, one of which that freewheels, one that does regen. Then you have the best of all worlds. You can run just one motor at low power levels while the other one freewheels. Uh, you have regen when you're going downhill or coming to a stop. Um, and then when you're going uphills or have high torques, you run both motors and the load gets the load gets shared equally between them, which is the most efficient way to do it. Um, and that can be done automatically by uh, with motor controllers that give you custom throttle mapping capabilities. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so this brings us to an end of the meeting. Uh, thanks again for the patience of all of you who stuck around for the, the first bit. And I'm a bit bummed that I couldn't show you how to choose that transition point, but it's a, a fun challenge for you guys to now play with the simulator um, and, uh, and brainstorm, or if you have an actual multimotor drive vehicle uh, in the works, you can now look at the, the performance of your system using the combined A plus B feature of our, of our motor simulator. And, um, and then I wish you the best of luck in your multimotor endeavors. Um, so uh, great, what I'm gonna do now um, is just scroll through some of the comments here and just see if there are um, uh, any questions that, um, that make sense for me to address that I didn't cover inside the presentation itself. Um, and then if you, while watching this, have any uh, thoughts or questions uh, right now, just uh, post it as a comment and then I'll highlight on the screen uh, whichever one I want to address here. Um, so, um, and see. it's just taking me a while to scroll through all of these. Um, um, yeah, uh, and I'm uh, sorry to everyone who we helped do dual motor e-bike systems before we had this cycle analyst splitter. Um, uh, but yeah, it definitely does make everything going forwards a lot easier. Um, and we know that some of the people um, who we've guided, they understood in, in principle or added the, uh, what needed to be done for a dual motor hookup, but got a little bit confused with the, the actual mechanics of splitting up the one control command to do two different uh, motor controllers. Um, and uh, let's see. Hmm. All right. Um, 
Uh, great. Uh, so one of the things that I, I sort of asked about uh, in the previous talk and, uh, and we'll be summarizing here is uh, topic ideas to go into for future presentations. Um, so I'm going to actually, at the end of this, I have a, a short list of the five that I'm most excited to, to give a talk about in the near future. Um, so I'm going to set that up as a, uh, I think I can add a poll to the end of the video so that you guys can kind of vote with what you're most interested in. Um, but that includes uh, the one that I'm, I'm really keen to do is just a deep dive into understanding motor efficiency. Um, and uh, um, actually, let me, um, and really how, what is the most efficient scenarios for using hub motors, mid-drive motors, geared motors, um, if you really want to geek out and understand, you know, going up a hill, should you go full power at maximum speed or should you go slowly so that more of your work is done by pedaling efforts? Um, when it comes to choosing between motors, the trade-offs of, of a mid-drive and a geared versus a direct drive and where the, from a purely efficiency analysis, where one has an advantage over the other um, that can help guide a decision-making process for people in choosing and selecting motors for their, their needs. Um, I actually had my short list is in my notes here. Um, so let me just increase this font size massively. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so here are some of the, the topics that, I'm, uh, that I'd love to, to go into in, in some depth. So uh, really talking in detail about motor efficiency and clearing up a lot of the misunderstandings that people have about motor efficiency. Uh, so many people look at a dyno curve, they see a point of peak efficiency and they think that that's some sweet spot or some holy grail zone that the motor can only operate in and that going at lower speeds is you know disastrous or, or a non-optimal use of the motor. Um, so, so much misinformation about motor efficiency that I'd love to talk about. Um, and I'm also really looking forward to doing updated presentation all about regenerative braking. Um, so I, I did a talk, uh, must have been probably 10 years ago now at the Electric Vehicle uh, Association here in Vancouver, um, discussing my early analysis and sort of, um, um, uh, I guess, a, a thesis on regen and how the energy that you can recapture from regen is more than the overall cogging drag um, and losses that you have having a direct drive motor that can do regen. Um, and I'd love to do a, a more updated and current analysis of that and also explain to people how to set up systems for regenerative braking and how to make uh, get most use out of regen. Um, another topic that comes up fairly often in our email stream are people using hub motors as pedal generators. Um, so some people just want to have a fun demo project for, for power generation and, uh, and just have people sitting on a bike um, pedaling a generator in order to, to run music, to turn on lights, to uh, power up a vending machine, whatever it is that, that serves their interest. Um, and, uh, and this is an area where there's capabilities in our motor simulator to really, again, help predict the optimal design and choose of a motor winding, a battery voltage, a controller type, or just a rectifier bridge to use a motor just as a pedal generator. Um, along that uh, line of thinking, we also get much less often, but of still significant <laughs> academic interest, um, designing all electric drivetrains. Um, and so um, an all electric drivetrain is a setup where instead of your pedals mechanically being linked to the wheel, your pedals are driving a generator, creating electricity, that electricity gets stored into a battery buffer. Um, and then your motor is running all, all the propulsions coming exclusively from the motor. Um, so this is a, uh, a totally unconventional approach to pedalable vehicles that's now rendered viable with the, the hub motors or the electric motors that are out there. And the, um, oops, this is a, a duplicate here. Um, um, and there's a lot of uh, interesting analysis that you can do on how to choose a hub motor to be the optimal generator. There's so many different motors that you could use that you spin with the pedals. Um, there's geared motors, there's direct drive motors, and there's a choice of, do you want the motor to be spinning at a really high RPM and a really low RPM? And in this case, because the amount of human power available to generate is, is limited, you know, 100, 150 watts is most people's sustained output. You really don't want to lose, you don't want to lose, you want to, to keep capture it as much as possible, because not only do you lose efficiency as a generator, you also lose efficiency turning that electricity back into power through the motor. So the round, we're much more sensitive to the round trip efficiency with all electric drivetrains. Um, and then uh, uh, going into uh, how to do a custom motor in the motor simulator. So our motor simulator right now has 
a number of um, preset motors that I've, I've modeled and dyno tested and characterized. Um, but there's also an option on the motor simulator um, to do a, a custom hub. Um, and if our website worked, yay, look at that, life again. Ah, thank goodness. Um, so tools, motor simulator, um, uh, right at the bottom here, we have our custom motor. Um, and uh, sorry, let me close this. Uh, oops. Um, uh, but yeah, so we've, we've allowed the ability for people to, if you have a motor that's not on our simulation list, to actually enter all the parameters that allow our simulator model to generate the output curves and the performance uh, capabilities of the motor. So I'd, I'd like to explain how to determine all of these values for any motor that you have, even with pretty basic electrical instrumentation. You don't need a dyno. Um, and then give people the ability to, to, to use our motor simulator for custom motors that we haven't yet modeled in our drop-down system. Um, and, uh, um, ooh, uh, this is a great uh, suggestion. <laughs> Um, so this is, can we talk about electronic freewheeling for direct drive motors one day? Um, absolutely. I am actually should add that to the list. Um, actually, rather than um, this, this uh, deep discussion about virtual electronic freewheeling is something that I'll probably factor into my presentation on regenerative braking, because uh, the two topics come in together um, and uh, overlap quite a bit. Um, so when I do my regen talk, there'll be a large segment of that that's allocated to this electronic freewheeling feature, um, which is something you can do with more advanced motor controllers to negate one of the perceived downsides of having an always engaged direct drive motor or a geared motor with a lock clutch. Um, and, uh, and yeah, explain uh, where this feature um, uh, can be really useful to, uh, to people. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that will be part of a, a regen discussion. Um, uh, this a uh, comment from Noe here. Um, uh, legacy, no chains, no legacy drive train is the future. Um, so this uh, refers back to this discussion of doing all electric drive trains. Um, and the immediate reaction from anyone who's an engineer when it comes to this discussion of an all electric train is egads, the efficiency is going to be abysmal. Um, so you know, you know that uh, a maybe 85% might be your best kind of mean of average efficiency for a really well-designed electric vehicle setup. Um, but if you have 85% in a pedal generator and 85% coming out of the motor, it means the total system efficiency uh, for you to pedal, make electricity and run the motor is 85 squared, um, which is uh, somewhere just north of 70%. Um, uh, so that's 72% efficient. And if somebody had proposed a pedal drivetrain where 72% of your pedaling energy gets wasted, uh, people would think that's um, a total non-starter. Um, but uh, even with that round trip efficiency not being so great, um, there's a lot of things you can do with an all electric drivetrain that in some situations may still result in you having better net mileage from an electric drivetrain than a mechanical one. Uh, one of those things is that you can sit there and make electricity when you're stopped at a stop sign or at a red light. Um, or when you're going downhill on a normal bike, you're just coasting um, and the human power is kind of useless. With the electric drivetrain, you can still continue to generate electricity. So even though you're not, the electricity you generate is not coming back 100% to the motor, you can make power for a longer portion of your ride. Um, and given the fact that most of the power in an e-bike comes from the battery rather than the human anyway. Um, the benefits of, of uh, more optimized mechanical layout, eliminating the air resistance and drag and complexity that you have to factor in with a mechanical linkage um, can potentially make a vehicle that is more efficient overall than one that doesn't have this. Um, uh, so what's this question? Um, how would you set max regen battery current on a dual motor setup? Uh, that's a, a good question. Um, the answer to this is that uh, I would always set this to be the maximum of what the battery can handle. It really has nothing to do with whether you're dual motor or single motor. Um, and the point of regen is to come to a stop more so than to put energy back in the battery pack. Um, and so you want the ability to come to a stop as much as your, um, as much as your uh, vehicle needs you to come to a stop. So limiting to a, you would limit your battery current 
um, simply based on what's a safe short-term amperage have flowing back into the cells. And a general safe number for this is 1C. Um, so if you have a 20 amp hour battery, you're probably fine to put 20 amps of regen current. Um, you wouldn't charge the battery from full to from empty to full at 20 amps. That would definitely reduce the cycle life. Um, but short, you know, uh, short excursions of 1C uh, charging, even with your average, you know, average cells that are used in e-bikes like the Panasonic GA, the Samsung 35E, um, we've seen no evidence that that has any negative effect on the, the cycle life or the, the lifespan of the battery pack. Um, but having dual motors just doesn't weigh into this equation at all. It's really a question of your battery more than the motors of the motor controller. Um, so uh, talk about maximizing system robustness. Um, that's a, <laughs> a great topic too. And that would be, you know, I'm just gonna add to this here, um, um, installation um, so this all comes down to the, the, the bigger topic of just DIY e-bike installation um, and uh, and what techniques we can have to make the, the installation robust um, so there's the types of connectors that are used protecting the connectors or anything that's vulnerable to the elements from the elements um, also, a lot about mechanical. Um, the vibrations that you get on an e-bike um, are, uh, especially when you're on uh, trips in, in other countries or touring in, in places where the road conditions aren't all that great, the vibrations can be extremely harsh to the components. Um, and a lot of times, motor controllers, battery chargers, uh, electronics that you bring with you on an e-bike will fail because vibration fatigues and cracks heavy electrical components that are on the circuit board. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it's true that, um, uh, a lot of people, a lot of the problems that people have with electric vehicles come down to issues with their connectors, the wires, cables getting abraded, uh, connectors coming loose or getting corroded. Um, and this would be a really good topic to discuss our long and rich experience with e-bike systems and what we would recommend, uh, for doing a, a robust install that's not vulnerable like that. Um, now this question, is there a clutchless easy motor coming? Um, this I've actually been in discussions with uh, with Easy, with Ching about doing just like he did with the GMAC, a, a version with a lock clutch. And they actually already produce an easy motor um, uh, without a clutch. They, they uh, sell that to an application where it's used on uh, electric assist wheelchair systems where um, you're not pedaling and uh, you're under motor control all the time and being able to use regen is really valuable uh, for their customer who's making that product. Um, uh, but for us, for us to do a, uh, a easy motor that does regen like the GMAC motor, it's really important that not only do we just lock the clutch, but that we have an axle that can have a spline torque arm interface because we're not comfortable using just axle flats and conventional torque arms uh, for regen systems that can do regen at the intensity level that the easy motor can do regen. Um, so yeah, it's a, a, a project that we're working on. Um, so um, uh, so here's a question. Uh, how about the front wheel traction at speed um, where you're cornering hard in the center of gravity on a fat mini bicycle frame? Um, so front wheel traction is one of the concerns a lot of people have when we suggest front hub motors for their application. Um, and it's definitely the case that if you're on a vehicle where there's a lot of torque on the motor, so if you're running a high power and you have you know, over 50 to 60 Newton meters expected out of the wheel, um, then the uh, a wheel, a front wheel can be prone to skidding out on a typical bike geometry because you have, you know, three quarters of the weight of the riders on the rear wheel. Um, and this question about cornering hard on a low center of gravity mini bike bicycle frame, um, that's not my <laughs> my wheelhouse at all. So this is a, the kind of question we get from people who ride motorcycles. Um, and I don't really ride motorcycles and corner hard uh, with myself angled down. I tend to ride a little bit safe. Um, and, uh, and so I can't speak firsthand to this, this thing of, you know, if you're turning really sharp, your bike's in an angle and you could have the front wheel drive skid out versus not having it skid out if it wasn't powered. Um, our, my response to this is that uh, it, you can always have some amount of torque on the front wheel. Um, and 
uh, you just size the maximum torque, you set the, the maximum phase amps of your front wheel motor controller so that that's a torque level that doesn't produce any extra risk of skidding out and loss of traction. Um, and a huge factor in that is based on the geometry of the vehicle, how much of the rider weight is actually on the front or the rear. When you're cornering, you get centripetal forces that are part of the picture. You have a more sliding moment present, um, but that also helps. Uh, does it help with the traction? No, not really. I, I, I don't have a, I haven't really put a whole lot of thought about what sharp cornering, what the, the um, traction ramifications are for front propulsion in that situation. Um, uh, perhaps somebody who, who rides uh, electric motorbikes and has done a dual wheel drive motorbike might be able to, to comment here and give, uh, um, give some feedback to Matt. Um, and, ha, hey Jack, <laughs> awesome to hear from you again. Um, and uh, <laughs> I should try building a solar powered tandem half rowing bike and cycle to Iran with two motors. Indeed. Um, so uh, I don't know what's in store for our next uh, wild, wacky vehicle, but I think that um, I'm I'm really inclined to try something with this all electric drivetrain. Um, and my first plan for our SunTrip tricycle that had this solar rowing station was for the rowing component uh, to be an electric generator. I really thought that that would be the most ideal way um, to configure a, uh, um, a rowing machine because it seemed like it'd be way easier to mechanically hook up a generator to that than find a way of linking it to the pedal drive train. It was just pure fluke that we saw this opportunity of having uh, the rowing person doing things mechanically. Um, and uh, and uh, our hope, as I, I mentioned in the solar presentation, I, I really would love to do a North American uh, solar e-bike tour that just crosses coast to coast uh, across the continent uh, here. and. Uh, and certainly that will be an opportunity to build something pretty unique and fun and encourage some others to do so as well. Um, uh, are there mid e-motors with integrated gears coming? Um, I don't totally follow this question. Um, if that's referring to integrated gears in the, in the rear hub, um, doesn't totally make sense. Um, most mid motors, oh, I see. Hmm. Maybe he means where you can change the transmission of the electric motor to the pedals rather than having the ratio from the motor to the pedals be fixed. Um, that I haven't heard anything of about. Um, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't fully understand the, the nature of the question, uh, Mordecai. Um, hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, so this is uh, one, <laughs> one constant of this presentation that I, I was hoping to come across is that um, in some cases, it's going to dissuade people from doing dual motors. Um, but uh, really, when you understand all the complexity and cost, if there is one motor up to the task, um, it's across the board simpler. Uh, um, so, uh, so yeah, it may burst a few people's bubbles that we're excited about. And we got a lot of this when we showed our video of us electrifying the cat trike with two Grin motors on the side. Uh, there's a flurry of, of inquiries we had from cat trike owners thinking it was so awesome and wanting one. And, uh, and then when we asked them, well, what do you want out of the bike? Well, like, what trike? <laughs> what are you looking for for your speed, your power? What kind of hills do you climb? Um, almost all cases, they would have been perfectly well met with a powerful rear motor like a GMAC or the RH212. Um, and the dual motors really only came in as an essential option when a rear motor wasn't possible. And that happened when people already had a 14-speed roll-off hub on the back. They weren't going to give that up to go back to derailleur gears just for the sake of a rear hub motor. And then dual motors was the only choice that was viable. Um, so, um, and uh, uh, yeah, um, so that's it. Uh, I think at this point, it's uh, it's not quite been two hours, but getting close. Um, uh, I'm going to wrap up this presentation now. Thank you so much to everyone who watched and uh, um, gave comments and feedback along the way. Um, and uh, suggestions for, for topics that you might want to hear about in future presentations. Um, so as I said, I'll try to post, uh, update the description here to have a link to those simulation results um, and hopefully do an update where I can post now that there are simulators working again, where I can show how to actually find that optimal point um, between switching from one motor to two motors. And you could then run that same uh, analysis for any motors of your choice if you're doing a, a dual or a triple motor system. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so we will leave that at that. Uh, just uh, one quick comment. Uh, so I addressed this in the presentation that there's absolutely 
um, no need for a special consideration for cornering for adjusting the torque of each motor. Um, tricycles, when you do corner on a trike, you tend to unload the inside motor because you're being tilted over sideways. And it is possible for the inside motor to skid out a bit because there's so much less weight on it. Um, but again, that's usually when you're cornering on a trike, you lean <laughs> as hard as you can to keep yourself from tipping and to keep weight of the motor. So the consideration when cornering is really keep your weight on that inside motor. If it does come off the ground and then the wheel spins and then it hits the ground again and skids for a second, um, not at all the end of the world. And most of the, um, yeah, it's, it's not gonna affect your handling or your riding of the vehicle at all. As soon as it's touching and not skinning again, then it has the full traction that it otherwise would. Um, you do see a lot more tire wear with tricycles, um, but that's really a result of mechanical slippage. So when you're steering, the inside motor needs to turn a little bit more than the outside, but you always have a little bit of sli sideways sliding that causes a lot of rub and tire wear. Um, and uh, it might be that electric exacerbates that a bit because you could have a little bit of skidding from unweighting the motor, um, but there's no consideration. This only has to do with the weight. It's not because the motor is spinning at a higher speed or a lower speed when you're cornering. All right, okay, so I, uh, I concur with uh, Rishi's statement. Um, everyone have a great remainder of your Sunday. Uh, those of you here in BC celebrating a Victoria Day long weekend, um, have a great long weekend, myself included. Uh, so I'm gonna check out now. Um, thanks again for uh, being a faithful audience and I'll look forward to the next event uh, in either two or three weekends from now. All the best, guys.